Great, so I'm gonna kick us off. It's great to see all the action in the chat box. Do you keep um, continuing to introduce yourselves there, but I'll, I'll give a welcome and, and introduce the session. We've still got a few more people joining us so they can continue trickling in. But good afternoon and thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon for this event on trauma, gender and culture informed approaches, how to embed it in your services. I'm Katie Boswell, Associate Director for Strategy and Leadership at MPC. And this event is part of our research partnership with Fulfilling Lives, Lambeth, Southwark and Lewisham, which is a national lottery community fund funded program, which is working for eight years, working with people facing multiple disadvantage. And we're delighted with this research partnership to also be working with colleagues from Groundswell and from the Center for Regional Economic and Social um, uh, Research. I nearly forgot what the second R at the uh, at Sheffield Hannam University. And you'll be hearing more from colleagues from there later today. This event is coming off the back of our first research output, which we're really excited about, a literature review produced by colleagues at Sheffield Hallam University. As I said, you'll be hearing more from them later. We've also got a couple of people from Filling Lives, Lambeth, Southwark and Lewisham, that we'll also be hearing from. And we're really excited to share our learning from the literature review with you this afternoon and to hear your reflections on it. We think that this topic is a really important one and that it applies beyond Lambeth, Southwark and Lewisham. And I know that many people in this room this afternoon bring your own personal, professional or lived experience of the topic. So we've deliberately built some time into the agenda to discuss these topics and hear your reflections. So I'm really excited to hear from that as well. Before we get started, um, I just wanted to lay out a few ground rules and give a bit of an overview of the agenda that we'll be covering this afternoon. So first to say, do join the conversation on Twitter. You can see the hashtags there and do keep continuing to join in the conversation on the chat box. It's great to see so much interaction going on in there. I'm gonna lay out a few ground rules before we get started. Then we'll be hearing from Steve and Kezia. Um, about their main insights from the literature review and we'll be hearing some perspectives from personal experience from Katie and Charlotte at Fulfilling Lives Lambeth Southwark and Lewisham. Then everyone will go into breakout rooms, we've got some facilitators who are various members of the research partnership and then we're going to have some time to report back and hear some Q&A from all the speakers. Before we begin can I ask yourself to please mute yourself when the speakers are speaking Please note that you can then unmute during the breakout room discussion or use the chat box to contribute. And do, as I say, keep using the chat box to introduce yourself, share your thoughts or to ask questions. We're going to take a selection of questions for the Q&A at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Steve and Kezia from Sheffield Hallam University. They alongside colleagues, Lindsay and Sadie, who are also with us today. So you might meet some of them in the breakout rooms, some of you. Um, have produced a fantastic literature review for the research partnership and I'd fully recommend that everyone reads the full literature review uh, because there's some, some amazing insights in it. I have asked them to speak for only 10 minutes this afternoon so they will be only scratching the surface of this fantastic literature review that they have uh, put together. So we will be sharing the link for the full literature review for those of you that want to read more. So without further ado, over to you Steve. Uh, thank you, Katie. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. I was, um, it was a great pleasure to see when you were putting in your chat um, the wide range of organisations that we've got here today. Um, and that's wonderful. Some that I know have been working very, very well on um, these kind of new ways of working that we're going to talk about today. Let me just introduce you to other members of my team. Um, so we've got Kezia Reeve here. Um, we've got Lindsay McCarthy and we've got Sadie Parr, all of whom were involved in the literature review. And to spare our blushes rather, Kezia and I would point out that uh, Lindsay and Sadie did the majority of work on this and uh, rather Kezia and I were sort of in the background. Um, in, in a more sort of um, uh, more standback capacity uh, but nevertheless it was a great piece of work and um, we're really pleased that we're getting the opportunity to launch it. Could you move me on a slide please Katie? Great so uh, we've only got a short period of time to talk and I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of what we intended to do. So we wanted to produce um, a detailed understanding of how particular groups 
um, within the sort of fulfilling lives target population um, do have different experiences um, due to the sort of diverse effects of uh, the social and cultural factors, all the things that get in the way, all the things that either um, without, with, without per particular purpose cause, um, cause um, a lack of diversity, or um, cause inequalities in the system, that kind of thing. Um, so we wanted to explore the evidence, um, you know, what actually do we know already about the cultural and gender and trauma informed uh, philosophies that underpin uh, these kind of things. Uh, and uh, really following the sort of the fulfilling lives um, themes, I think we wanted to bring together sort of evidence about access to services, um, transitions with and between services, and more of an understanding about how that system behaves for people facing multiple disadvantage. Okay, can we have the next slide? Good, so yes, we've got a short period of time, so I'm gonna run through these things very quickly, but I think these are some important points to make, and things, these are things that really came out of the uh, literature for us. Um, so on principles of trauma-informed care, um, we've got a list of them here. I think the first one is actually, you know, recognising and responding to trauma itself. You know, so do organisations understand the prevalence and impacts that trauma has for people? Do they recognise the signs? Do they recognise where it exists and, and some of the symptoms that, that might come from that trauma? Um, you know, and do we revise our sort of practices and procedures um, as services? according to that and do we also make sure that actually in delivering those services we don't actually re-traumatize people um, second i think having a safe environment i think many of you will be um, familiar with the sort of the, the pie the psychologically informed environments um, things that include make a makeup of that would be trust collaboration um, choice empowerment and safety those kind of things and I think third which is really important actually is sort of staff training support and supervision I think what 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 you find is that a lot of services actually people have ways of protecting themselves workers have ways of protecting themselves by not getting too close to people by following a standard script and whatnot in the absence of, of that proper training support and supervision about trauma about culture about you know gender informed services so actually it's about it's about having a trained and supportive workforce that's very well managed in order to provide that Let's move on to the next one. Uh, so number four, um, again, it's about sort of power dynamics sometimes, about empowering those relationships and, you know, previous experiences of trauma, they may under, undermine clients' ability to trust people. And I think we sort of see through Fulfilling Lives and lots of other programmes, the number of people that have engaged with lots and lots of services and have just been burned out by that and have lost trust in any process. Uh, and whatnot. It's about how you re-engage people who've been through pretty terrible um, ordeals and experiences and may have been actually turned away from services um, in a variety of ways. I think number five, taking a strength-based approach. I really like the work that Mayday Trust do and St Mungo's and um, Thames Reach and others on this. You know, so moving from saying, tell me all the problems, tell me what's going wrong with you, tell me, you know, all those bad things to considering what happened to you. You know, what would you like to do next? How, how can we support you? Uh, those kind of things. Um, and I think really important, number six, equality of access. So I think it's about often a recognition that the, that the services that are offered are actually not uniform. They're not, they're not um, universal. They appeal and attract different groups better than they attract others. And how we sort of think about that and whether or not the standard approach that we offer is, is suitable for all groups. Now, I think um, all of these things, and we're going to talk about some of the barriers, but require a sort of wholesale organisational change. You know, they, 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 they aren't just tinkering, um, they often uh, require, you know, a lot to be done. Can we go to the next one? Okay, so just very briefly on the sort of culture informed stuff, 
you know, I think actually what we found was the real lack of evidence um, that considers culture informed approaches, despite the sort of social and cultural norms impacting on those individual support journeys. So while it's a really important topic, maybe this is an area where we just need to do, um, we just need to do uh, a lot more. I'll not say anything else on that because I just want to turn now. If you just click to the next slide, Kezia, would you mind saying a little bit? I don't think Kezia's going to follow this slide, but just say a little bit about gender informed approaches for us. This is one of Kezia's areas of expertise. Thank you, Steve. Yes, no, I'm not going to follow Steve's slide because um, it's Steve's slide, not my slide. And I'm afraid I'm not actually going to talk from the literature review either. I'm, I don't have any slides, but I have lots of opinions. And um, yes, I think Steve just wanted me to say a few words about the importance of gender informed care and gender informed approaches. And um, I have to say, I, I was thinking as Steve was handing over just how nice it is to be in a situation like this where I'm actually being actively encouraged to emphasize the importance of gender informed care because I am so often in similar situations where I'm having to go um excuse me can I can I just say is that really what you're saying is that really taking account of, of gender differentials is that really going to work for women is that and you know and my interjections then you know, rarely met with with any kind of resistance, but they're also not met with a great deal of enthusiasm often, um, which I find incredible. Um, but I sort of feel like what I'm saying might be a bit inconvenient. Um, but it's so self-evident to me that gender informs our experiences and therefore has to inform our, our responses to experiences. And I know that because my gender has, has affected my life and, and everybody's has. Um, so I think gender informed care and service delivery is important, it's crucial, because quite simply, to not do that has severely detrimental consequences. And I do sometimes wonder whether we don't think through those consequences and we don't track that chain of events that happens when somebody is deterred from using a service or is not able to get the support that they need because that support and care or that and that service is not informed have, is not gender informed and does not understand those differences in experiences um, so we talk about you know barriers to accessing services or for women perhaps um, but but what actually happens once that barrier has presented prevented somebody from having the service and i think if you do trace that chain of events we can sometimes be talking about the difference between life and death when it comes to it at the very end of that. Um, we did some research recently about homeless mothers and uh, Sadie and Lindsay were involved in that too. And many of the homeless mothers that we interviewed had experienced domestic violence um, at some point. Um, and many of them had, had rent arrears and property debts um, from that, that time when they were experiencing violence. So there was a woman just thinking about those kind of consequences there was a woman for example who had debts on her property um, for criminal damage um, from when her ex-partner had been very violent to her and had also damaged the property um, some time later she goes to apply for social housing um, and she is barred from bidding for any properties because of that debt okay so now she is now going to be homeless so then she starts living apart from her children because she doesn't want her children to be homeless with her. So then you have the trauma of her domestic violence compounded by the trauma of her not being able to live with her children. And then perhaps her mental health deteriorates. And then perhaps she starts self-medicating because of with drugs and alcohol and so on. And you keep going and you can end up in, uh, with a difference between life or death. So it is absolutely crucial. But a key point I wanted to make actually is that it's not just it doesn't begin at the point of that service encounter that frontline service encounter and i think we really have to go right back right back to our definitions and understandings um because so for example how we how we define we talk about this a little bit in the report actually about how we define multiple disadvantage um, or complex needs or multiple exclusion homelessness um it really matters because how you understand and define those issues and those population groups feeds through into the policy response and then that feeds through into funding and commissioning and into eligibility criteria 
and then the service and the care that is ultimately provided. Um, and I know we talk a bit in the report about the way that definitions of what, what's often termed complex needs, um, you know, when it doesn't include domestic violence as one of the, the sort of experiences that mean you qualify as having complex needs that mean you can qualify for the services, it suddenly looks like a more male population. You put domestic violence in there and it doesn't. That makes a difference at the end to, to, to the service provision. Um, the, the parallel there for me, and I'll, I'll just finish on this point in terms of thinking about tracing through consequences from how we understand an issue right through to what happens at the end of that, is with rough sleeping. Um, and I take any opportunity I can to make this point, so apologies, I'm, I'm using this one. Um, you know, the, the, un, the definition or understanding that people have of rough sleeping, and it always has been, is as the most visible form of homelessness. For many women, rough sleeping is the most hidden form of homelessness. So we have something there where actually men and women's um, experiences, um, or certainly cisgender men and cisgender women's experiences, are almost diametrically opposed. Yet yeah, our, our methods of enumeration of rough sleeping and our, the policy response to rough sleeping is based on that being a visible population. And so back in whenever it was, 1989, 1990, when somebody said, I think we need to start enumerating this population. Um, how do we do that? Oh, well, I know we can see them, so let's count them. So then we start counting them and then we find out that they're mostly men. And, you know, and then the policy response is that what well, we can do out and I know outreach workers try really hard to, to, to find the more hidden groups as well. But, you know, and then the whole policy response is, is based on that. Um, and I was doing some research. This was some time ago. I will finish on this. Um, when it was in London, it was around the time that the Rough Sleepers Initiative was still going. And in London, there was a, a, a system of um, some hostel spaces were kind of ring fenced to people that were. Um, referred through that initiative and through the rough sleepers team. So in order to be counted as a rough sleeper, you had to have been seen sleeping rough. I think it might have even been for two or three nights, but I could be wrong there. And I was interviewing women in London at that time who, who, who were rough sleepers and who were hiding, and they had to go and make themselves visible and therefore place themselves in danger in order to be able to access that support that was available for rough sleepers. And in some cases, a number of women told us that they had been advised to do that because that was the way of receiving that support. So you have a situation, hopefully that doesn't happen anymore, but you have a situation there where because the policy response was not, because the understanding of the problem was not gender informed, you end up in a situation where you are putting women, vulnerable women in significant danger. And that, that is why, gender informed care and practice is not just a, it's not just good practice, it's not just something we should do or something that is shown to be effective, we have an absolute duty to do it. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant and I hijacked Stephen's Thank presentation. you ever so much, Kezia, that, that was, uh, that was it. A, uh, extremely enlightening, thank you for that. About it. Go um, Steve, sorry. That's okay. We had a couple of slides on sort of barriers to implementation. You can see them there, but I won't run through the points for, um, you know, I certainly would really like to hear from um, uh, Charlotte and Katie um, as well. So that's all included in the report. There was also some examples in there. As Katie said, please, um, I'm sure the links have been shared. I'm sure they're in this presentation somewhere. Please do go and have a look at the report and dip in and um, do get in touch with us um, if there's anything in there that you would like to do discuss. Um, thank you. Thanks Steve and Kezia for a brilliant and passionate overview of what I know is a, a complex topic and I think it's really powerful to, to hear that point particularly about, about gender and we know also about culture um, and we see that trauma-informed approach is one of the key principles is the quality of access but we know in reality that it's not happening in so many places and that's something we're finding in our, in our wider research partnership with Fulfilling Lives Lambeth, Southwark and Lewisham. So thank you so much. I'm now going to hand over to Katie and Charlotte um, from Fulfilling Lives, Lambeth, Southwark and Lewisham to share a bit more about their perspectives. So over to you, Katie. Hi, lovely. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much to the previous speakers. It was really, really interesting listening to you both. Um, so I'm going to be doing the majority of the talking today, I'm afraid, as Charlotte has been representing us in so many different forums recently. 
and didn't have time to plan for today. Um, she's just about to start a law degree, so has rightly been focusing on getting ready um, for that. But Charlotte, please feel free to step in and contribute whenever, whenever you want to. Um, I wondered about being asked to talk at this event. Um, I have lived experience of multiple dis disadvantage, but I am some distance away from that now. But my experiences have stayed with me and make me the person that I am today. And they also still feel relevant as what I experience, I have watched the people that we support in the programme continue to experience. Um, we talk in the programme about people not being hard to reach, but that it's the system that's hard to access. And I kind of wholeheartedly stand behind this hypothesis as it rings so true with my own experiences. And this also seems to be supported by the literature review, which is really validating. So like the system or rather the people within the system, because the system isn't actually a machine, um, doesn't always recognize the impact of trauma on a person's behavior and how they might then relate to others. And when they do recognize it, they don't always know how to best manage it. Um, I first prevent, presented at a drug service when I was 18. I had just escaped a very psychologically, physically, sexually violent relationship. And my experiences of violence and abuse had led me to pretty serious drug use. Uh, I'd lost touch with my family. I was homeless. I was getting involved in criminal behavior and sex work. And as you can imagine, I was not in a good place either in, uh, mentally or emotionally. Um, I was newly addicted to heroin and had just that week overdosed with a friend where I had survived and he had died. An event that, you know, still after all these years feels very raw. Um, and I walked into that service carrying all of that baggage with me on my own, off the street. And I sat in a mixed waiting room with people who were a lot older than me, um, looked different to me um, and to be honest I was terrified I didn't know if I was doing the right thing or what to expect but how I came across could easily have been perceived as angry defensive or shut down you know I, I was very you know, cagey and mistrustful but also you know really desperate for help um, I was assessed a long string of questions from a stranger about my circumstances he wrote everything I said down on a notepad and I left an hour later with a handful of leaflets, a script for methadone, and basically having told him nothing about the things that I was going through. Uh, the whole lot of stuff that he gave me went in the bin and I didn't return to services for several years, uh, despite my life spiralling further out of control and several workers along the way trying to encourage me to engage. Now, I'm not telling you this for like, the lived experience shock, fa shock factor. And I'm sure you will have all met people in my situation and worse during your work or have experienced similar things yourself um, in your own lives. But I'm, I'm saying it to highlight that if that first worker I met at 18 had an understanding of trauma and how to recognize it in a young woman new to services, and if that service had been better designed for me walking through the door, I might have had a very different and more useful first experience. I think what I needed and what I eventually found after several years and other difficult interactions with services, um, including drug services, the criminal justice system and social services after my first son was born, uh, was a, a safe space, a trusting relationship and time to process what I had been through and to think about what I needed to do to begin healing. I didn't need to be told what to do. I needed to be supported to come to my own realizations. Also, in hindsight, what I needed was a service that was run by women and provided support for women my age. I needed to have that identification, having someone who had been through it, you know, to explain the process to me also, I think would have helped. Um, my recovery process wasn't linear. I messed up and I made mistakes. I carried a lot of guilt and shame, drug, using women, especially those who have children, face a lot of stigma, even within the drug using community. Um, and there were external barriers being turned down for funding for detox and rehab, which was devastating and being moved around temporary accommodations um, and the whole process just, just took time. But what helped me 
going through a lot of that, apart from my own determination, was uh, a straight talking, honest, funny drug worker who had my back. Uh, she offered me flexibility. I know that she broke a few, few rules and she just never let me down. Um, I learned to trust in that space and that opened me up to trusting other people along my journey and eventually um, helped me to kind of stabilize my life. If I think about what might make the difference for people moving forward, I think the answer, or partly the answer, is in collaboration. Um, professionals and people with lived experience from different backgrounds working together because if you want to create and deliver services that successfully meet the needs of marginalized groups you need to get them involved you know they will tell you what they need you just then have to kind of listen and act on what you hear you know invest your time and resources into helping people realize their own power and potential and then explore together maybe how things look like outside of traditional structures we also need to reconsider the way we criminalize people who are experiencing trauma, you know, punishing their behavior rather than addressing their needs, as was my experience, you know, it's not helpful, you know, prison isn't the answer. And if we truly want to be trauma, gender and culturally informed and stop people from having to experience multiple disadvantage at all, we need to think about long term prevention over crisis management. And that means addressing some of the bigger societal problems that lead to people growing up without support networks. We need to think about what causes the breakdown of families and communities, what causes the trauma that is passed through generations, and we need to reevaluate the criminal justice system, housing, social care, and education, and we need to address poverty, misogyny, and racism kind of across the board. We really need to focus on how we build and sustain strong, healthy communities who can support each other and look after their most vulnerable. Um, I know these are big topics and they can't obviously all be addressed in this hour and I can get a bit soapboxy. So um, I think I will leave it there. Thank you. Katie, thanks so much. <laughs> see if Charlotte wanted to come in. Yeah, I mean, I just, I can, I think that the access to, um, for women in particular, um, we've been doing a lot of work with the NECG as well, and that's a big theme that's come up is just access to services and the initial point of contact and how important that is, um, you know, and how that can, that can stop someone from, from carrying on. It's not just the initial, it's also the con continuing to engage. Um, and how actually, I mean, we've talked a lot actually about having um, peer support involved in that process because hearing someone who's been through it and knowing that they've, they've been able to come out of it um, is, is always, you can relate to that person a lot better maybe. But um, yeah, for me personally, um, I've, you know, frontline drug service with a mixed waiting room, you know, I've gone in there very raw, very damaged, very traumatized. And that's from, from my, my using gone in there, um, and been told that I've got up to a four hour wait, um, and literally sat down and, and just been petrified about who's going to come through the door and then just left the building, um, as well as outside. You don't know who's going to be out there, who's hanging around out there. The likelihood is that it's someone that you, well, I've been in an abusive relationship with, someone that's, you know, I've experienced trauma. So um, that that needs to, I think, I think once we can try and sort out that, you know, try and get some kind of that, like they say, you know, trauma-informed, gender-informed perspectives and, and try on services with the voice of lived experience with, you know, there's a lot of women that are saying this, we find this with NECG research as well, that um, they're hearing this over and over and over again, you know, for the same women, the same voices, the same, um, uh, well, not complaints, concerns, and yet nothing seems to be done about it. So, um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. That was amazing. Thanks so much, Katie and Charlotte. I um, really appreciate your thoughtful reflections. And, and I think that's so powerful, that, that point that it's not people that are hard to reach, but it's the system that is hard to access, badly designed, and quite often disempowering. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us this afternoon. Um, and particularly, Charlotte, thank you for taking time out from your, your first week in your law degree, which is very exciting. So thank you.
Great. So, um, and I can see actually you're getting wild applause in the, the chat box as well. So a lot of, uh, a lot of reaction from people there. We are now going to break into breakout groups so that everyone has a little bit of a chance to reflect on what you've heard. But I know people will also have, um, have questions to the speakers. So, so do hold on to those. We will have a chance um, if people write those questions in the chat box to pick up on some of those, those later on. Um, but in a minute, you'll be put into breakout groups and we'll be looking at three different questions. We've only got about 10 minutes for the breakout group, so you might want to focus on just one of these or you might, if you have a chance, get round to several of them. Each breakout group, when you return, I'm going to be asking you to share one top insight or light bulb moment from your conversation. So it'd be great if each group could nominate somebody who's able to report back when you return. Great, so hopefully everyone should be getting into the breakout group soon. You should see a pop-up appear and join one. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you had some great breakout room discussions. Um, certainly in my group, it was really interesting. I'm going to share my slides again so that we've got a reminder um, of what the questions were that we were all considering. Uh, there's a number of breakout groups um, and you might not know your breakout group number. So I thought it might be easier to do this in order of the questions. And each group should know what your top insight is that you're reporting back on and hopefully you know which question it refers to. So if we start with question one, who has got an insight to share about why aren't trauma, gender and culture informed approaches implemented more often? I can jump in from my group uh, if that helps. Um, shall I just go? Cool. Um, so we were talking a lot about how systems and programs are developed with a male lens so that uh, they don't account for women's needs. But the big thing that it kind of came back to was purely just a lack of education of what people need and, um, and a general lack of uh, education around the, these approaches and how to do them well. And so we thought that sort of underpinned a lot of it. Yeah. Excellent. And I can see, Steve, you've got your hand raised. So I'll yeah, so we, yeah, we were group seven. I think just on the first point, um, really interesting discussion and I think you know it, it was clear that the effort to implement new services and things at a sort of big organisation level is often too great for organisations it often sort of scares them with resources with costs and things like that but actually you know one way of getting around that is that sort of small steps that step-by-step -step incremental approach you know doing little things where you can and letting and letting that grow does have some advantages particularly around workforce development things that train workers to be better in, to be better um, sort of in, in empowered for people who walk through the door and how to treat them how to speak to them you know how to address and understand those symptoms that they might have uh, was really clear so that would be our sort of um, take from that which I think is uh, which I think is is really laudable it's a pragmatic approach to take these things forward pragmatic is always good thanks Steve <laughs> and next I can see Sarah from Fulfilling Lives has got her hand up I was just going to add um from our group I think from the yeah maybe key thing was just like um being really honest about the fact that it you know it, when you're implementing a trauma-informed approach it does take a bit more time and um yeah like take on it in terms of training and just that it just takes more time and, and more resources um and that can take a bit of time for staff to see the benefits um and yeah i just thought it was really good to have be really honest about that great okay pragmatism honesty i'm liking where this conversation is going so I can't see any more hands raised for this one. So I'm going to move on to the second question. What would help more organisations to successfully <coughs> adopt these approaches? And we've touched a little bit on this already. But who'd like to come in on question two? Um, Great. Um, sorry, to... Will, uh, do you want to go next? And then I think I saw yeah. Lauren as well. Um, we're in, I think, in group nine. And we basically identified two key issues um which is the first one being why would people leave before they're able to access help um so actually doing more research on 
why people felt engaged with the service and actually perhaps it was a time constraint, perhaps it was the atmosphere of the place that they were in, um, but often there isn't enough sort of data recorded on, on people that have initially tried to access that service and left before they could get help because obviously those people might be incredibly vulnerable and not confident themselves to sort of commit to something um, because of the nature of, of different sort of traumas and experiences. Um, and also uh, the second point that we identified was the... Sorry, Will, um, I'm going to have to cut you off. I'm, I'm not oh, allowed no, no, to no, that's okay. point. So I'm going to go to Lauren and then Susie. And can I ask you both to be fairly brief so we have a bit of time for Q&A with the speakers? Um, I think we were saying um, in group five that it was kind of hard to uh, not hear um, Katie and Charlotte um, and their experiences. So I think one of the things that would help is having um, more people with lived experience on in an advisory sort of capacity higher up so that um, people who are heading the organisation would have to listen about how um, these approaches need to be put in practice to help people when they first come through the door. Fantastic, thanks. And then Susie. Um, we had a brilliant idea, which I can take absolutely no credit for, um, but you know, something like a um, gender-informed, um, trauma-informed manifesto, something positive that um, organisations could rally around and, and share to um, a good practice. Maybe such a thing exists, um, but I thought that would be a good way of helping organisations to adopt these approaches. Great, thanks. I'm going to move on to question three, because um, I know at least my group um, did this one. So um, Helen from my group, and then anyone else you'd like to come in on this one, put your hand up in the, in the Zoom. Thanks. So um, our group um, agreed that having service users involved um, was really key. So echoing the points the previous group raised. Um, so listen to service users, actively involve them, um, new services being about co-creation. Um, and uh, another critical thing is to get buy-in from all levels of, of staff right up to senior management. Um, allow time to embed new things, take little steps, um, start with simple things like changing language and policies. Um, I think that summarises what we covered. Brilliant. Excellent summary. Thanks, Helen. Anybody else? Any groups we haven't come to yet? And do also please write your questions in the chat um, because we've got a few minutes left at the end to do Q&A. Okay, so group one um, talked to... Can I, can I go? Go for it, Di. Um, so group one, we had a really interesting conversation about actually having uh, funding and resources to be able to implement a more informed approach and recognise that actually as a system we're very crisis reactive we're doing some really positive work but we need to have the space to be able to reflect and really evolve in these approaches and we had two funders in our in our in our group that really had the appetite for collaboration as well so i think yeah capturing those sparkles in that group was great as well fantastic sounds like a great conversation are there any other groups that i have missed yeah, you haven't heard from my group, so I didn't have to put my hand up, <laughs> so I'm speaking now. Uh, we only focused on question two, and I think some of the some of the discussion in our group, uh, you know, it, uh, it has already been mentioned by other groups, but uh, certainly issues about the importance of involving people with lived experience, both in, in the service delivery and peer support, but also <laughs> in understanding what goes wrong and being able to then develop those services better. Um, the fact that this cannot be a niche, this cannot be a niche thing, this has got to be, which doesn't mean we can't have specialist services, but this, the, you know, gender culture and trauma informed approaches absolutely have to be mainstreamed across everything. Um, and, and, and my group also talked a lot about how we've got to get the foundations right, the data, we've got to ask the right questions, we've got to collect that evidence um, and really get that right. Brilliant, thanks Kezia. And I can't see any questions in the recent chat. I'm just going to check with my colleague, Catherine, who's been keeping an eye on it throughout the session, whether there's any questions from earlier up that came in for the speakers. Uh, no, we haven't, we haven't got any at the moment. So please fire away if anyone has any. Great. And if we, yeah, so please do feel free to write questions in the chat. Um, if we haven't got any questions, then I am just going to ask um, the speakers of each of them just wanted to give a very quick reflection um, on all the conversation um, that we've heard. So, so Kezia, we've just heard from you, which is great. Um, Steve, did you have anything? And then I'll come to Katie and Charlotte just to see if you've got any final points that you wanted to respond to. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Um, I think, you know, another thing that I think that's come through really is actually, 
you know, the importance of, of, of events like this, important of sharing and learning activities and actually distributing that knowledge. You make it mainstream by talking about it a lot. You make it mainstream by, by the activity that, that goes around this. I think another absolutely critical point as well, which was discussed in our breakout room actually, and there is something in the literature review about it, is this whole idea around co-design. Co-design is actually so fundamentally important but actually a lot of people don't know how to do it properly um, and I think that's it for a lot of organizations and a lot of people doing that well um, and actually getting that right is is absolutely absolutely critical and and is a real gap and somewhere where I think you know we could go a lot way a long way in um, in offering some really good training and support around that I say we I mean the royal we you know the government can get involved in this as well and gives a bit more money for these kind of things so thank you Great, thanks Steve. Katie, uh, did you have any final thoughts that you wanted to share? Only, um, I guess that, you know, Steve just kind of said it really, it's just that, you know, to implement real change that is going to be long lasting and make a difference, it's about collaboration, it's about working with people with lived experience, it's about sharing power, it's about giving, you know, sharing responsibility and resources and doing things together. Um, and also just that Michaela's idea for a manifesto, I'm like totally down for that. So if that ever happens, count me in. <laughs> Amazing. And Charlotte, did you have any final thoughts you wanted to share? Um, just to say that it's great to hear, you know, how enthusiastic people are about having the voice of lived experience at, you know, a, a design level of a service. Um, because... I think I think that's the way forward for, for every service and I think we'll engage people both initially and keep them re-engaging and engaging for a longer time um, if, if that if that happens yeah thank you thanks and that's a great point to end on I think that that enthusiasm that we've seen this afternoon um, I feel like there's a real energy in these conversations um, and I'd like to, to thank um, all of our speakers so Steve Kezia Katie and Charlotte for um, for bringing um, such insights that I think have really got people talking. Um, we're really keen to continue this conversation. Um, I think we've been sharing the links as we've gone through. Um, but if you do want to find out more, then do make sure that you read the full literature review. There's also a link to a PDF version there. And there's various other links that have been shared in the chat. We will be sharing um, the slides and everything afterwards. And do reach out to, to all of us. Um, at MPC, Sheffield Hallam University, Groundswell and Fulfilling Lives, if you'd like to continue the conversation. We're really interested in making this very much an, an open research partnership where we are learning with people across the sector. I'm sure we'll be doing more events in the future as well, so watch this space and do keep engaging with us all. Thanks to everyone who's attended today for your energy, your enthusiasm and for all the great ideas. I would love for us to all keep working together to make this mainstream. So thank you. Thank you, everybody.